Okay, hi everyone. Um, my name is Kit Hayam. I'm currently a lecturer in the Department of Humanities at Northumbria University. Um, and I'd like to say thanks very much um, to both the Early Modern and 18th Century Centre and Queer Disrupt for their very kind invitation to give this paper. Um, particular thanks, of course, to um, Hannah, Nick and Charles and Aidan for all of their help in putting it together. It's really great to be here, metaphorically if not physically. Um, so this video is going out in two different contexts. So hi to everyone at Warwick who's going to be watching it first, um, and hello also to um, all of the people who follow Queer Disrupt on Facebook who are going to be watching it later. Lovely to be speaking to all of you. Okay, so the work that I'm going to be talking about today comes from something that I touched on briefly in my first book, which um, just came out last month. Um, it's called The Reputation of Edward II, 1305 to 1697, A Literary Transformation of History, um, and it's published by Amsterdam University Press. And if, if anybody would like to ask their library to order a copy, then please do. Um, the book is about how Edward II developed his queer reputation in England over that 400 year period. Um, and more broadly, it encourages us to rethink the boundaries between literature and history in two senses. Firstly, it argues for the productive potential of undertaking close textual analysis of texts of all genres. Um, and secondly, it argues for the substantial influence of literary techniques and literary texts on the writing of history during this period. Um, and my reason for telling you all that is not really to plug the book, um, but it's to contextualise the kind of history that I do, which is one that's informed by literary texts and techniques as well as, as historiographical ones. Um, so with that in mind, I hope you'll forgive me if I start my paper with a poem. Um, this is a poem that appears in a significant number of histories of witchcraft, um, though most often it appears as a footnote. But it is, it is a poem that goes to quite some lengths to articulate a polemical position on the nature of witchcraft and the way that it's talked about. Um, it was composed during the 1590s, circulated in manuscript, printed in an unauthorised edition in 1628. But these stanzas that I'm going to read to you first appear in the authorised printed edition in 1629. Um, and I'm going to tell you more about the poem later. But first, I want to share the text with you. Here we go. Witchcraft may work upon the body much, but there's no fascination of the mind. The soul is free from any magic touch, nor can enchanting tar charms or loose or bind the powers and faculties thereto assigned. Spirits may suggest, they may persuade to ill, but all their power cannot compel the will. I'll skip three stanzas here for brevity. They deal with what God and the devil respectively can and cannot do. Um, and then we get this. Besides, when any error is committed, whereby we may incur or loss or shame, that we ourselves thereof may be acquitted, we are too ready to transfer the blame upon some witch that made us do the same. It is the vulgar plea that weak ones use. I was bewitched, I could nor will nor choose. Now, as a theorisation of witchcraft, and an expression of 17th century scepticism about the validity of witchcraft accusations, these verses have attracted a fair amount of attention from historians of witchcraft. Um, P.G. Maxwell Stewart's Witchcraft, A History reads them in the context of broader scepticism about testimony relating to witchcraft, particularly children's testimony or malicious accusations. Um, and also in the context of what he calls, and I quote, scepticism about the extent to which diabolic temptation, witchcraft or other forms of magic could compromise a person's exercise of free will. Um, and Deborah Willis uses them as an example of the accusation that bereaved mothers who attributed their child's death to witchcraft were acting weakly or insincerely, in her words. Um, and she positions her own sympathetic reading of these mothers' witchcraft accusations in opposition to verses like this. Um, they appear in a few other histories of witchcraft too. And it certainly is useful, as these historians do, to position these verses in the context of developing scepticism about witchcraft accusations, um, and indeed in the context of the growing philosophical movement of scepticism more generally. Um, as early as 1584, after all, Reginald Scott's discovery of witchcraft had taken a scathing attitude to the majority of accusations of witchcraft, connecting them to Catholic superstition. Um, and Michel de Montaigne, as well as expressing a more generalised philosophical scepticism, exclaimed in his Essay of Cripples, printed in 1580, and I quote, 
How much more natural that our understanding should be carried away from its base by the volatility of our untracked mind than that one of us in flesh and bone should be wafted up a chimney on a broomstick by a strange spirit. So it makes sense then to read the verses with which I opened this paper in this wider intellectual context. Um, but what I find curious is the widespread lack of acknowledgement of the much more local context of these verses, which is that they're situated in the context of discussing a romantic and sexual relationship between two men. And more specifically, they're part of Francis Hubert's long narrative poem on the reign of Edward II. Now the poem is narrated by Edward, um, and these verses come in the context of his reflection on the excessive nature of his love for his favourite Piers Gaveston. Um, and now while we can't be certain about the nature of Edward and Gaveston's relationship, um, although as the work in my book shows, Edward II's reputation for sexually transgressive behaviour did develop during his lifetime, as early as 1312. It is undeniable that by the late 16th century, when Hubert's poem was first composed, a consensus had taken hold in English historiography that Edward's relationships with his male favourites were both sexual and romantic. And I'm not going to say loads today about how that consensus took hold, but if people want to talk about it um, in the discussion afterwards, I'm more than happy to do that. Um, and so the verses that I just quoted you are bookended by Edward's acknowledgement that he has no one to blame for his attraction to Gaveston but himself. And I'll quote some more. He says, It is too true, my dotage was extreme, and I did prize him at so high a rate that he, my crown, my life, weighed at a beam above them both. I him did estimate, which was indeed my folly and his fate. But that the same was wrought by magic spell is such a tale as old wives used to tell. And then come those verses on witchcraft more generally, which I've quoted already. And then Edward, as narrator, says to confirm, but my affection was not caused by art. The witch that wrought on me was in my breast. My Gaveston wholly possessed my heart, and that did make him swell above the rest. So what Hubert's character of Edward II is doing here is acknowledging that plenty of writers have accused Gaveston of bewitching him, and I'm going to say a little bit more about that later on, but that these accus accusations are in fact little more than a convenient excuse, and that really no one was to blame for Edward's transgressive love for another man except Edward himself. So by situating Hubert's verses in the context of other expressions of scepticism, the historians I discussed earlier strip them of both their immediate historiographical and their queer context. And what I want to do in this paper is to resituate them in that context um, and to see what other relevant contexts emerge when we do that. Um, and in doing this, I'm going to suggest a new direction for the way we conceptualise the place of witchcraft in queer history. Um, now, this is work in progress. I'm not quite sure yet whether it's on the scale of like a notes and queries article or something more substantial. Um, so I'd very much appreciate any and all feedback, comments, suggestions, questions that can help me develop it further. So I mentioned then that Hubert's poem is not the only account of Edward II's reign to deal with the question of whether Edward's favourites bewitched him into loving them. Um, and this accusation is first found in two contemporaneous sources written during Edward's lifetime. Um, two Latin chronicles which are independent from each other, the Vita Edwardi Secundi and the Annales Paulini. Um, so the Vita Edwardi Secundi states that um, our king was so incapable of moderate, was incapable of moderate affection and on account of Piers was said to forget himself and so Piers was regarded as a sorcerer. And the Annales Paulini explains Edward's behaviour at his coronation, um, where he reportedly paid more attention to Gaveston than he did to his new queen Isabella, um, by describing Gaveston as a magical and maleficent man. Um, in early modern texts, the rhetoric of bewitchment or enchantment is also used. It's used by the chronicler Richard Grafton, it's used by Abraham Fleming in his additions to the 1587 version of Hollinshed's Chronicles. Um, it's used by Christopher Marlowe's play, Edward II, um, which, as I show in my book, was more influential over subsequent chronicles than most chronicles were. Um, but the most detailed expansion on those witchcraft accusations is made by the chronicler John Stowe um, in his chronicle, which became his Annals. Um, and he writes, The king gave unto Piers Gaveston all such gifts and jewels as has been given to him, with the crowns of his father, his ancestors' treasure, and many other things, affirming that if he could, he should succeed him in the kingdom, calling him brother, not granting anything without his consent. The lords, therefore, envying him, 
told the king that the father of this Piers was a traitor to the king of France and was for the same executed, and that his mother was burned for a witch, and that the said Piers was banished for consenting to his mother's witchcraft, and that he had now bewitched the king himself. Yeah, these accusations upon accusations. And so the collocation of this charge of witchcraft with the a description of the financial and political favours that Edward bestowed on Gaveston it suggests that once again witchcraft is being offered as a possible explanation for Edward's excessive love for his favourite. However, the accusation is presented as a result of the nobles' envy and about, as a result of their anger about Gaveston's political power. Um, and this is how... If historians have written about it at all, this is how historians have approached these references to Gaveston's supposed bewitchment of Edward. Now, we know, of course, that witchcraft accusations were used as political tools in early modern Europe, including as a mechanism to discredit or bring down over mighty royal favourites. Um, as historians, including Stuart Clark, Brian Levesque, Johannes Dillinger and um, William R. Jones have written about in some detail. Um, and we know too that witchcraft was collocated with sexually transgressive behaviour in medieval and early modern European thought, and um, particularly in treatises influenced by the sexualized portrayal of the witch in the Melius Maleficarum. So it would be understandable to interpret these stories of witchcraft accusations against Gaveston, who is portrayed both as Edward's excessively powerful favourite and as his romantic and sexual partner, as reflecting both of these habits of political and demonological thought. But there are other aspects of the way that the figure of the bewitching Gaveston is constructed which fit less comfortably into this model. And to put it simply, the way that Gaveston is characterised in early modern historiography means he doesn't really work, demonologically speaking, as a witch. His gender is one problem. Um, as Stuart Clark has shown, witches were conceptualised as inherently female, um, and their temptation into witchcraft was conceptualised as a consequence of what were considered in early modern misogynistic discourse to be feminine traits. Um, the early modern character of Gaveston shares with the stereotyped early modern woman a lustful disposition. Plenty of texts of all genres comment on that. And so we could argue that he's somewhat feminised in that respect. Um, but far from being subject to his lustful desires, as the early modern witch must be in order to be tempted by the devil, Gaveston exerts erotic agency. He uses his sexual attractiveness to manipulate the weak and equally lustful Edward, both politically and sexually. So to use a phrase coined by Blair Morris in relation to Shakespeare's Othello, um, which we're going to briefly encounter later, um, in representations of Gaveston we see a demonological heteroglossia. And so I want to suggest that we should take seriously this heteroglossia, that we should pay attention to the fact that, if you'll, if you'll forgive me a deeply clunky metaphor, the, the Gaveston-shaped peg doesn't really fit very easily into the witch-shaped hole. Um, and I want to propose that what we're seeing here in these various accusations of bewitchment against Gaveston is not an orchestrated attempt to discredit a politically undesirable figure by means of accusations of witchcraft and sexual transgression. Instead, I want to suggest that we can read them as excuses which help to exonerate Edward's transgressive queer attraction. And I want to argue that when we do this, we unlock a new way to read the discourse of bewitchment in early modern political and religious thought. Now, in order to do this, we need to think first about why Edward's transgressive queer attraction might need to be excused or exonerated. And the clearest summary of this comes in a later account of his reign, written by the chronicler Nathaniel Crouch in his 1695 text, The Unfortunate Court Favourites of England. So as Crouch puts it, Edward's nobles did verily believe that Gaveston had bewitched the king, or else he could never retain such an unreasonable passion for so profligate a wretch. And so Edward, in falling so excessively for a, such a manifestly unsuitable love object as Gaveston, um, whose pride and financial malpractice and low birth and insufficient Englishness and fashionable triviality and many other undesirable characteristics are enumerated at great length in medieval and early modern historiography. He's presented as behaving so unreasonably as for his behaviour to be inexplicable without some kind of supernatural cause. <laughs> 
And so the need to account for Edward's behaviour while absolving him as personal responsibility is what we see here. It was stronger in early accounts of his life, those written during his reign or during the um, reigns of his immediate descendants. Um, and those texts also routinely attribute all of Edward's poor political decisions to the evil counsel of his favourites rather than to the king himself. But even in later texts, which engage much more reflectively with the problem of what we might kind of boldly sum up as how to describe a king who did some very stupid things, um, the tendency to kind of just blame his favourites for everything is still very much evident. Um, and we see that in Crouch, although um, that kind of oh, it must have been witchcraft sentiment is put in the mouths um, of Edward's nobles, it's still something that's being given a kind of legitimacy um, by its inclusion. So blaming Edward's transgressive queer desires on bewitchment was part of a broader strategy of negotiating the problem of a monarch who must be flattered, but whose behaviour must still be criticised. Um, and indeed, some writers, like the poet Michael Drayton, will um, use other techniques to achieve a similar end, um, such as representing Gaveston as irresistibly attractive, such that you couldn't possibly um, kind of not give in to your attraction to him. Um, I won't dwell on that here, but suffice it to say that if you have read Michael Drayton's poem, Piers Gaveston, Earl of Cornwall, you come away with the very strong impression that there has never been a sexier man than Piers Gaveston. Um, anyway, though, what I want to show in the final part of this paper um, is that this strategic figurative use of the discourse of bewitchment in early modern thought went well beyond accounts of Edward II's reign. Um, it extended to other royal favourites or royal sexual partners, um, to other kinds of transgressive relationship, and in fact to a range of other political and religious contexts in which it was necessary to condemn the behaviour of a person or group of people while simultaneously flattering them and making it very clear that they were absolved of any personal responsibility. So several high profile English mistresses um, or favourites about whom sexual rumours circulated have been accused of bewitching their monarchs into loving them. Um, the chronicler Thomas Walsingham, having set up Alice Perez as a thoroughly undesirable love object, um, he describes her as a shameless impudent harlot who was of low birth and not attractive or beautiful claims that she consorted with an evil Dominican friar to seduce Edward III with magic potions and charms. As Henry Kelly and others have called attention to, one of the sorcery charges um, on which Eleanor Cobham was convicted stated that she had, quote, enforced the foresaid Duke of Gloucester to love her and wed her. John Wilmer, Earl of Rochester, wrote a long and quite silly poem um, dedicated to Louise, Duchess of Portsmouth, one of Charles II's mistresses, describing her various charms that have bewitched him, as if a conjurer's rod had switched him. George Villiers, Duke of Buckingham, not a mistress, but certainly a favourite whose, re whose relationship with James VI and I was subject to sexual rumours, was accused in a 1626 pamphlet by George Eglisham of having enchanted many members of the court into supporting him, as well as having bewitched James specifically so that James would hate anyone who crossed him. And in all of those examples, the accounts combine an emphasis on the undesirability of the love object with an emphasis on the excessiveness of the monarch or aristocrat's love for them. Um, and in most cases, um, Rochester's poem being satire is an exception, they also combine it with fulsome praise of that monarch or aristocrat. And the bewitchment accusation is what ties those three elements together, is what makes them logically consistent. It's what me makes it possible to praise a monarch while saying, your love is really excessive and the person you love is really terrible and not someone you should actually be attracted to in a romantic or sexual sense. And in fact, investigation reveals that this strategy of flattering an addressee while framing their behaviour as clearly reprehensible had applications in early modern culture well beyond the paradigm of royal favouritism. And therefore, that this discourse of bewitchment as excuse found its way into other contexts too. One of its most well-known applications is in Shakespeare's Othello, in which um, Desdemona's father, Barantio, incredulous that his daughter would voluntarily have married him more, accuses Othello of bewitching her. He tells Othello that Desdemona would never have 
and I quote, run from her guardage to the sooty bosom of such a thing as thou, if she in chains of magic were not bound. More broadly, it seems that this discourse of bewitchment as excuse was also used outside of references to transgressive romantic and sexual relationships. We see it deployed firstly in texts addressed to monarchs which walk the tricky line between flattery and persuasion. Um, the anonymous 1572 text, A Treatise of Treasons Against Queen Elizabeth and the Crown of England, which aims to, um, I mean, nice hope, but aims to persuade Elizabeth that Mary, Queen of Scots, is innocent of the various treasonous, treasonous activities in which she'd been implicated. Um, this text lays out its evidence in favour of Mary's exoneration, and then it exclaims, and I quote, This being so, what less or other can it now be than a plain bewitching that your queen by which he means Elizabeth, being of so rare wisdom for a woman, faint praise, um, should yet be circumvented and blinded. And so as with the examples above, bewitchment here is presented as the only reason that someone so wise and amazing as Elizabeth would make such an enormous error of judgment. The author doesn't go any further with their references to witchcraft, they don't accuse anyone specific, they don't provide any kind of demonological or logistical detail of what they think this bewitchment supposedly consisted of. And so bewitchment here, it's not a practical accusation. It's a rhetorical strategy, which allows the author to criticize Elizabeth's actions while absolving her of blame. In this discursive context, then, the verb bewitch appears to have taken on the metaphorical signification of lead astray. Um, and this meant that it could be used in political contexts, um, Sir Richard Hacklett's um, Principal Navigations accuses Spanish soldiers who attempt to turn English soldiers to their cause as tr of trying to bewitch us from the obedience of our natural prince. And it also meant it could be used in anti-Catholic context. And this is the overwhelming um, kind of highest density where you see this kind of rhetoric. Um, you see the Pope and Catholic priests described as bewitching innocent people um, and even monarchs away from true religion. Um, and the flattering efficacy of this rhetorical strategy is particularly apparent in Erasmus's use of it in the dedication to his paraphrases on the New Testament, um, which is addressed to Edward VI and condemns Henry VIII's conservative religious reforms while absolving him of blame in order to keep on the right side of his son. Um, so he recounts how, and I quote, some of the priests had now in these last years, um, meaning in the last years of Henry VIII's reign, um, through their juggling, their false packing and their plain sorcery, bewitched King Henry with a wrong persuasion. And there's an enormous number of other examples I could deduce, um, many of which make use of St Paul's letter to the Galatians, in which he asks, oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? That you get a lot. I could give way more examples of the anti-Catholic um, use of bewitchment, but I hope you kind of get the idea of the way in which this rhetorical strategy is being deployed. Now, I want to be clear that the discursive phenomenon that I've been observing here did not go unrecognised by contemporary commentators. Um, early modern people did recognise that the literal use of the word bewitch could bleed into the figurative um, and that this could sometimes be harmful. Um, so as P.G. Maxwell, Maxwell Stewart has pointed out, um, Richard Bernard's 1627 Guide to Grand Jurymen noted that, and I quote, It is the general madness of people to ascribe unto witchcraft whatever falleth out unknown or strange in the vulgar sense. Um, and of course the quotation from Francis Hubert's poem on Edward II with which I began this paper indicates that for at least some people, patience with the use of this strategy for self-exoneration was wearing pretty thin. Um, so, given that this was acknowledged during the period to some extent, what makes it a productive topic of academic discussion? In answering this question and in kind of pulling these thoughts together by way of a conclusion, I want to return to the queer focus of my title. The place of witchcraft in early modern queer history has hitherto primarily been seen in relation to the conflation between social, sexual and religious transgression that both witchcraft and queer sex represented in early modern thought. Um, and so scholars like Alan Bray, Curtis Perry and Catherine Crawford have argued that the witch and the sodomite occupied a similar discursive and imaginative space. 
and moreover, the witchcraft accusations could be used alongside accusations of sexual transgression and heresy to discredit political opponents. But what I've shown here is that when the rhetoric of bewitchment was used in relation to early modern queer relationships, it could function as exoneration as well as a smear. And this was, as I've shown, a widespread discursive phenomenon that went beyond just the discussion of transgressive relationships. But because of the existing associative links between witchcraft and sexual transgression that I've mentioned, it did lend itself particularly to the discussion of those relationships. Witchcraft as a practice associated with femininity and thereby associated with the subordination of reason to the passions, particularly sexual lust, was a paradigm that suited the explanation of queer love and desire. And because that love and desire was seen as unreasonable, it demanded an explanation with which witchcraft provided. What this means is that tracing the rhetorical strategy by which accusations of bewitchment were used to excuse authority figures, particularly monarchs who experienced queer attraction, sheds new light on the mechanisms by which people negotiated transgressive attraction and their anxieties around it. And as such, it needs to be incorporated into broader projects of investigating the lexis and rhetoric around sexual transgression, and particularly the fraught and ambiguous language through which queer experience was negotiated in late medieval and early modern England. And this is a field that has been shaped by scholars like Valerie Traub, Madri Menon, uh, Geoffrey Maston, Tom Lincoln, um, and which my recent book on Edward II also intervenes in to some extent. Um, so attention to the strategic use of the discourse of bewitchment shows us, I would argue, that early modern commentators did not reach straight for fiery condemnation in the face of a monarch's queer attraction. Instead, they recognised that it needed to be carefully politically negotiated, and they approached that task with thought, tact and care. Diversifying our knowledge of how early modern people talked and wrote and thought about queer love and desire is important not just academically but politically. It helps us to deconstruct teleological narratives of move from prejudice to pride and to combat queerphobic contemporary commentators who try to use the supposed newness of positive attitudes towards queer experience to undermine our rights today. One more thing before I finish. Clearly we shouldn't over exaggerate the space for positive depictions of queer relationships that this stuff carves out. The rhetorical strategy that I've been talking about didn't enable commentators to say queer attraction is okay. It enabled them to say queer attraction is not okay, but if you're experiencing it and you're sufficiently important that I feel I have to make excuses for you, then it's not your fault. Um, you know, in some ways it's a kind of sophisticated version of the love the sinner, hate the sin rhetoric that we hear from today's Christian right. But we also shouldn't ignore one other association of bewitchment in early modern thought that I've only obliquely mentioned. It was used frequently and freely as a metaphor for romantic love, including licit and non-transgressive kinds, in texts from William Painter's Palace of Pleasure to Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Accounts of monarchs' transgressive attraction, which use the discourse of bewitchment to absolve them of blame, thereby also attract connotations of sympathetic, emotionally engaging romance narratives. And in my book, I talk a lot more about the way that Edward II's relationship with Piers Gaveston is constructed in texts of all genres as one of those um, emotionally compelling romances. And this point, the point that despite the problems with and imperfections of the discursive phenomenon that I've been talking about, is something that is both academically and politically important too. I'll finish there and I'm really looking forward to talking about this more with you. Thank you very much. <laughs>